I describe myself as a travel writer and um, a soon to be published author living in Byron Bay. If you only looked at Instagram, it would seem that the world really is Nina Karnakovsky's oyster. A travel writer, she's collected stamps in her passport from over 60 countries, transporting her readers to India, Africa, Antarctica and beyond. But in real life, this grounded wordsmith has also created rituals and sanctuary to balance out the beauty and mayhem of a career made on the road. On the eve of her first book launch, I visit Nina at home in the Byron hinterland to chat about not only her overseas adventures, but how she has been able to carve out her own life unhurried, helping to bring inspiration to those who want to walk their own paths and live more sustainably at the same time. kind of travel writing do you focus on? I really love very wild off the beaten track places. I like the empty places, places um, that have a real soul to them where I can kind of spend my time getting lost, sinking into really exotic cultures. Um, I'd, I'm not a lover of big cities, but um, throw me into a desert in Namibia and I'm happy. And that's a destination you went to recently. Like what are, yes. what are some of the places that come to mind when you, you talk about those really wild yeah. places? Well, I have a real love of Africa and I've been there probably about 10 times now. Um, yes, I was in Namibia for a few weeks uh, earlier in the year and I spent uh, a really beautiful time road tripping through the kind of more northerly part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, the year before that, I took my husband to Ethiopia for his 40th, which was just incredible. I mean, it's amazing. Oh, it's just you've got the Simeon Mountains where you can go hiking. Then down south, you have these tribes that are kind of almost untouched by the rest of the world, which is so unique. Um, and it's it's just the most incredible continent because you're you're seeing the cradle of humanity. That's where we came from. And it is just full of the most wild and untouched places. Mm. And then I guess that's the best material a writer could ask for as well. Like, you know, what does it give you going and, and doing those experiences when you, when you bring it all home here to Byron? Um, what does that look like when you sit down and kind of reflect? Yeah, well, I think I just, I also really crave, and I think so many of us who really love travel crave something that is just so vastly different to our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why I seek places like also like Mongolia or Papua New Guinea, where you're just seeing things that you never would have imagined existed and ways of life that just, it just teaches you so much about alternative ways of living mm -hmm. and so much that we take for granted about the way that we should live life and then you see incredible tribes or you know the nomadic people in Mongolia living in yurts and moving around and living in minus 40 degrees for big chunks of the year and you and you really reflect on that and ask who is living a good life here is it us or them or is it can yeah. we find it's it's fascinating to me just seeing those models of different ways of living I think that's really it and then when when it comes to writing stories you've really got something to reflect on there mm. and um, I think it leads to more reflective sort of writing and you can write stories that show how these places can kind of transform um, the everyday traveler and really I think the ultimate aim with travel is to get us thinking a little differently mm -hmm. about life Absolutely. and those kind of places for me really resonate in that way yeah, yeah so how does it feel to be able to say that you do that for a living I mean that this is your your um, craft your career your income how does it feel when you when you reflect on that it's a huge privilege. That's what I would say first and foremost. And um, I worked bloody hard to be able to do it. Yes. Um, and it isn't always the most financially rewarding career, but it is, it is just so incredible in terms of experience and 
um, the kinds of experiences this job has afforded me. Um, but I feel as though a lot of people uh, maybe glamorize the, the life of a travel writer and it is incredibly um, glamorous in some ways, but um, there's a lot of other elements that people are not factoring in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've had people say to me, oh my gosh, so it's your job to go on holidays. And you think, <laughs> oh, well, holidays are kind of a thing of the past. You never really go on holidays again, which yes. you would know very well. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're on a holiday, you cannot turn it's that impossible. part of your brain off. And you're yeah. always looking for stories and you're you're thinking, how can I package this place up for people and share it with people and that's a really um, difficult thing to switch off absolutely and look when we first met it's about six years ago now I think and you had just come back you'd been living in Mumbai in India yeah Um, you were still working full-time at at, at that point but you you know we were chatting and you were telling me how you really couldn't wait to be able to leap into the world of freelancing Um, so how does it feel now to look back? Um, where has that journey taken you uh, during that last six years? Yeah, wow. It's it has been it's been a wild ride because aside from traveling the world and seeing all these amazing places, from you know Antarctica to the Arctic to everywhere in between, a lot of life stuff has been happening too. Mm-hmm. So. Um, when I met you, we had just come back from living in India for a year, which I think when you can do something like that, really take a big chunk of time to live somewhere or travel somewhere for, for all that, it just throws everything back at you and you can never really look at life the same way again. So Mm. when we came back from India, my husband, who was an art director at the time, decided that um, he would become a biodynamic winemaker and take over the family farm. So we went and moved to a very rural location for um, a number of years. And so he had never had any experience with winemaking at that point? Not aside from working you know, on the family yeah. farm during holidays and things like that. Yeah. But he just suddenly realized that, you know, you've got this one life. Why not go take that leap and Amazing. see what else lies out there? And it was such a beautiful experience. And biodynamics is is an incredible way of farming. And um, he learned so much during that time. And I continued traveling um, all throughout that time. And look, I think when I first went freelance, it was... It was a scary time because Mm -hmm. there's always that there's always that kind of break between having had full time nine to five work and then leaping out into the unknown and having more time on your hands and having to hustle and doing all of that. And you've kind of got to de-institutionalize yourself a little bit and really start to craft your own days and Um, figure out how it's going to look for you and how you want it to look because it's Mm. your opportunity really Mm. to craft that kind of life that you might always have dreamt about but then you're suddenly in it and it's actually kind of scary and you need to figure out how you're going to play it so there were definitely a couple of years there where I was figuring that out Um, and yeah then then about 18 months ago uh, we decided to move up here to Byron Bay and that was another step again into the unknown my husband has opened up a natural wine bar up here and um, it's it's a whole new world yet again yeah Um, and continuing to travel the whole time and just also it's interesting because obviously the longer you do something that the, the more of it you do. Yes. Um, so over time, obviously, I've started traveling more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And at this point, I've actually taken a few months off traveling because I just found that I was needing to recenter myself a bit more mm-hmm. because it's so delicious to go on journey after journey after journey, but you really need that time yes. to stop and reflect and integrate it all and make sure that you're still doing what you want to be doing Mm. and that the intention and motivation is right. Absolutely. Mm. And I think saying no is the hardest part because you would get a lot of opportunities come your way or land in your inbox. And I think it's, yeah, it, 
it almost, I feel like it takes time to get to that point where you feel more confident to be able to say no or to be more selective with the type of work that you take on. Because I'm sure in the beginning, like I know myself, I really struggled with kind of transitioning out of that mentality that I needed to be at the desk for a certain number yes. of hours and I needed to, you know, be pumping out X amount of work. Yes. Um, but how have you, um, I guess, found your feet in terms of the that work-life balance, if you want to call it that? You know, are there, yeah. are there rituals or are there anchor points that you use to kind of help you stay calm in the craziness of it? Yes there are because you're you're absolutely right it is a very hard mentality to get out of and I think I'm still I'm a bit type a and I Mm -hmm. still have a lot of that I need to do this amount of work but um because the work is so you know when you're on an assignment you are all in and you have to be a hundred percent focused which is another thing I think people don't realize about travel writing you're not there laying on a beach you are on tight schedules and you want to give everyone your full attention and you are taking every single detail in and taking copious amounts of notes and photographs and everything. So you're out there in the world soaking it all up while you're away and then you come back and you're at your desk and things are slower but also you're processing so much. So Mm -hmm. you really need those anchor points. So For me, it's things I get up really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's I think it's actually a maybe it's just a travel writing hazard that you're five o'clock in the morning. You know, you just I I think my body clock just went a bit crazy (laughs) after all the travel. (laughs) And so I get up and I I spend some really good time in the morning journaling, getting everything out of my head, drinking tea, really centering getting out, moving my body and making sure that by the time I get to my desk, I am centered and calm so that I don't need to spend as much time there because Mm -hmm. I find that if I don't do the anchoring and the centering in the morning, I'll be at my desk for twice as long. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. Because do you find, yeah, your mind starts wandering more? 100%, especially without movement, Mm -hmm. I think, because... Mm -hmm being a writer as you know I mean you're you're you have to sit there yes I've tried other ways and it just doesn't (laughs) work you need to be in the chair producing the work so um if you can reach a point where you can focus Mm -hmm. and switch everything off I do other little things like turning off my email or trying to turn my phone off for chunks of the day so that I can just focus because look we're freelance for a reason yes. and um, there are definitely, um, I think there are some financial uh, sacrifices that you make and I always look at that and go, if I'm going to be doing that, then I want to be living my best freelance life, which mm-hmm. means not spending as much time working. Sitting at the laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm-hmm. And we were talking a little bit earlier and the fear um, that comes with leaping into, I guess, freelancing is one example, but other people that might want to, you know, get out of that nine to five, start their own business, do something mm. different. I mean, you were, you had that incredible opportunity to go and live in India. Um, was that something that you were considering before that popped up? Um, and the other part of that is, you know, what do you say to people when you, you kind of hear their their desires to maybe live a more of a lifestyle that you're living, but they feel too confined with, um, you know, the city life or whatever they might be doing. Yes. Well, I have just written a book about just this thing because I have had a lot of people ask me, you know, travel writing. Wow. How did you get to do that? And how do I do it too? Yes. And so I thought, you know what, I need to dive into this sort of thing. So the book is based around 26 different people around the world who have done exactly that, who everyone from a knitter living in New Zealand to a chocolatier living up here to a woodcarver living in America to a tiny home builder in Japan. So all these people that you might see on social media and go, excuse me, how do you (laughs) weave for a living? How on earth do you make money out of that? Um, And what kind of courage did that take to go and do that? And the people in the book all are super honest about how they started, Mm -hmm. how much money they started with, any sacrifices that they made. And I asked their advice, exactly what you've just asked me, 
what would you tell people wanting to live a more creative, free life like this? Yes. And so many of them said, I'm sorry, but I have to say, just do it. Yeah. Which, <laughs> which just sounds like the most ridiculous advice and the Nike slogan and all of that. But um, <laughs> it absolutely is that yeah. you yeah. have to leap out and do it. I think so many people talk about it mm. and think, oh, but, you know, obviously there's so much fear surrounding that. There's mm-hmm. fear of and real fears too, financial instability or yeah. failure or completely ruining the career that you're in. I had a couple of people say that who had amazing degrees and it had been in illustrious careers and who mm. gave it up and everyone around them is saying, are you crazy? You can't go and give this up and yeah. start. There's one beautiful girl in the book who has a um, company where she runs like dinners for women around the world it's called feisty feast and she has a various income streams she styles and she makes beautiful horse hair tassel necklaces and things but she was an art curator and she had studied that and she was working at a really amazing company and she then got made redundant Mm -hmm. and it was all her dreams were sort of dashed and she was forced into that position of that we almost all need to force ourselves into that position of going okay what do I really want to do because also the other side to this is a lot of people know they want to do something more creative but they're not sure what what that thing Mm -hmm. is so she just said she observed herself she took a couple of months off and she observed where she was naturally wanting to go with her free time she just Mm -hmm. watched what she was doing and she just noticed that she was just cooking all the time and wanting to entertain all the time. And so she figured out how to make a business out of that. So yeah, it takes a lot of courage to step out and to do those things. And I think one of the things that can be, you know, kind of put people, make them feel a little bit disillusioned with it or that it, you know, it isn't possible or that it compare themselves too much is how much social media is ingrained in our lives right now and you know using it for work you understand how much you know it can be such a benefit but it can also be such a curse um you know how do you feel about instagram and that whole world and i'm sure that you you know how does the nina on there compare to the to the real nina do you get asked that a lot of times yeah i mean i think this was a big impetus behind the book as well, Make Mm -hmm. a Living Living, because exactly that. I think it's such a, there's such a sheen over Instagram and so many of us know that it's there and yet it still makes us feel terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, even for me, you know, I could go on there and have this terrible feeling of I'm not enough or whatever when I go on there and see other people, even though I know, I know what's happening. Um, So I thought it's going to be so nice to really dig into these people's lives and go like well what else is happening Mm. there and what is the reality and I remember the the girl who's doing the incredible knits that are selling now on Netta for amazing amounts of money and she's supporting all these women in Peru and all these sorts of things she said to me oh you know half the time I'm living on potatoes but (laughs) I love what I'm doing and I mean, that's just one example of like what's going on behind but there. It's so I, nice to have that honesty because, yeah. you know, that's not something that people share as exactly. often because it's not glamorous. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I like to share little things like that on mm. Instagram as well because I think it's it's because the, the platform is the way it is. It's, it's arty. It's everybody wants things to look beautiful and curated, but then it can lead to this um terrible way of thinking where we expect that every moment of life is going to be like that and um I mean as I say I am very type a so (laughs) a lot of the time things are quite (laughs) um (laughs) polished yeah um but yeah I just think that it's it's really nice to see a lot of people being more honest about what is going on behind the scenes and I think people are recognizing the power of vulnerability and um, talking about the difficulties Mm -hmm. behind some of the things that they're doing. Do you consider yourself an influencer? I mean, I think anyone who is putting stuff out there on on any kind of platform um, is. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think, I think 
that's why I'm, I think I'm a lot more careful these days about what I put out there and I'm a lot more considered. Mm -hmm. I don't post as much. Um, I really think about the messaging that I want to put out there because you realize that it, it has power. Mm. And if we want to, I want to be contributing something of substance yes. as opposed to just look at my fabulous life yeah. traveling around I want to I want people to think and learn and they're the accounts that I love to follow people yes. who are really giving something of themselves and trying to do their little part in mm. bettering things well and I've seen a lot of posts recently and really talking on the topic of sustain sustainability which mm. is such a huge uh, you know area of focus in the travel industry um, you know at the moment and I yeah. guess like you as I would like feel that I guess that level of responsibility because it is 100%. our jobs, you know, we're jumping on planes and going and doing mm -hmm. all these things. But how, how do you feel now when, you know, you, it's like as soon as you start to know more about, you know, the effects or yeah. the causes or what's going on, I mean, you can't unknow that stuff. So how has it changed the way you travel? That is so true. There's no turning that tap off, mm -hmm. which is, um, I kind of love that. Yeah. Um, I had a bit of a moment recently where I was offered this this trip that was a sort of bucket list trip to do an assignment going on private jet around Africa to six different countries in 12 days or whatever it was. Yeah, right. And I just, there was me a year ago who would have leapt at that, but I just thought I can't be part of this anymore that mm -hmm. is not sustainable and it's actually not the way that I want to travel I mean we're talking about life unhurried here yeah that is not <laughs> seeing the gorillas in Rwanda for two days you're not going to learn anything mm. about the country that way so yes. I really had a moment where I thought okay I want to change the whole way that I'm going about this mm -hmm. and really try and do less trips try and do them for longer periods of time trying to learn more while we're there. I mean, there's so many things that we can be doing and there's so many, I actually thought of myself as quite a sustainable traveler, but once I started going down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. I realized, oh my goodness. I mean, aside from the carbon that we produce with our flying, I yes. mean, there's just hundreds of things from, mm -hmm. you know, choosing responsible companies to travel with and choosing locally owned hotels to, how do we photograph places in a way that is culturally sensitive? Mm -hmm. How do we share our experiences on social media mm -hmm. in a responsible way? What do we do about geotagging? How, what kind of sunscreen do we wear when we're on coral reefs? I mean, it yeah. is... How much do you pack in your bag? How yeah. much do you pack in your bag? <laughs> and like, yeah, just, just the whole... It's a whole world out there. And I think until now, people have been... It's been, it's been kind of a side, a little aside to the travel industry, but mm -hmm. I think it's becoming so much more mainstream now. And yes. so there are some really beautiful, luxurious options in that realm as well, which yes. I really like that it's yeah. becoming, um, it's becoming more integrated and everybody is so interested in it. Mm. And, um, I just... I'm so passionate about it and I love everything that I've been learning and mm. thank God for Greta Thunberg for yeah. changing the way we all think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that you've changed um, in the way that you travel now? Yeah, well, okay, here's a recent example. I, you, I have to go to Sydney every now and again mm -hmm. to see my family and usually I would not think twice about hopping on a plane, but I have just started thinking even small things like that, what can I do? Mm -hmm. So I took the train instead and um, it was long, but it was fantastic. <laughs> and unfortunately we don't live in a country that yeah. has a great train network, but things like that. But so yeah, looking you. at ways um, to slow things down. So next year in April, I'm going to Uzbekistan mm -hmm. and my husband and I thought, hang on, how about we meet up in India after that, but we can overland so we can save up all these trips yes. that instead of going away every six weeks or whatever, yes. we save all of that up and go on a longer trip, Amazing. take it slow, do it overland, do it, do it properly yes. rather than just jetting in, jetting out yeah. um, because it just doesn't feel right anymore. And I think that's a really good point about the planning process because, mm. you know, travels become such a 
part of the everyday now where yes. you don't think twice like you say yes. it's very reactive a lot of people like people are traveling more they're able to just jump on a plane and you know jump on the latest deal and get over to Bali or whatever it might be but rather than being reactive in that way if you're able to forward plan a lot more yes. and be more conscious about it um, you know I think that's definitely the way forward to be able to spend more time in places because you know it might still be the same amount of annual leave for somebody but just doing it in a smarter way oh exactly mm. I think that's exactly right kind of like batching it all yes so that you can it. go and have a really meaningful experience Mm. and it leads to it leads to better memories Mm -hmm. I mean any trip that I have taken a long time to do we went to Israel a couple of years ago and and hired a car and just went through the desert there for about a month and taking that time I mean it's just so vivid Mm -hmm. for me and there's some trips that I've taken for work that have been so fast that honestly I I sort of have to think wait did I, did I go have I been to that country and yeah. that's terrible yeah and I mean obviously we still have to make a living mm-hmm. um but what I want to be able to do is show people how to do it better yes and fi- we can still and make it work for you as exactly. well and the lifestyle that you want to have because that train journey um like you say it's a it takes a long time to, yeah. to get the train to Sydney yeah. but I mean what did you get out of that experience what oh. what were you doing during that you know however many hours <laughs> you, you get to see the landscape unfold yeah. it's the journey not the destination it's yes. all these things that we know but I think I think we've just become we've become a little bit um we just want the quick fix and the easy thing yes and I think we have to undo a lot of that and think the way that our grandparents would have mm. and do things slower mm-hmm. not always go for the easy option because the easy option has decimated the planet mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. from everything from single-use plastics to the, the speed with which we travel to the fashion that we wear that's so disposable yeah all those things we have to look at ways to slow it all mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. And I think that that's sort of the mentality. You don't have to be on the road to be able to do that. I mean, you would know having moved to a new area, a new town, um, you know, in what ways do you bring that ethos into your everyday life here? Yeah, that's a good question because it's actually interesting. I think a lot of sustainable living is almost living as though you were traveling Mm -hmm. as in living on a smaller scale living with less stuff doing all those sorts of things um living in byron bay i mean this place is just the sustain the sort of utopic uh sustainability kingdom here so um there are some really incredible examples of of people doing living Mm -hmm. life sustainably Mm -hmm. um everything from going to the local market to get your food to really knowing the farmers and knowing your community Mm -hmm. and sharing things and people are all we've we've converted some of our gardens here into veggie patches and we share with our friends and things like that and um to it's and it's again it's like macro and micro it's all those little things too like just last week I had a revelation of wait do I need a bin liner for the bin no (laughs) that's another piece of plastic I can do without just questioning everything yes washing my hair I'm looking at the plastic bottle wait do I need the plastic bottle no I don't there's another way around that it's yes question everything and there's always a better way to do it yeah yeah absolutely and being um conscious in that way and being more present in what you're doing you know it might be whether you're on that train journey down to Sydney or going out for a bushwalk um Mm. near here but how much does gratitude feed into it for you because I think if we all had practiced a little more gratitude for the experiences that we have when we travel or even you know living in our hometowns I think that could really shift a lot of people's um feelings about the things that they're doing and also the memories or you know the things that they're creating out of travel yeah I think that's a big one and that I think gratitude it helps stop that kind of greedy fast mentality that we have it Mm -hmm. certainly has helped me because I think I used to feel like if this travel opportunity has come to me like I must take it you know but if you just step back and go hang on 
I've had some really incredible experiences this year. Let that be enough and yes. start every day with just being grateful for all those small things. You find mm -hmm. that you need less, you crave less, you desire mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. because you're appreciating what you have. And it sounds so it's sort of twee in a way or obvious, but it is so, so powerful. And I think it can really help with the speed of things. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it's the most powerful way to, to start slowing things down and yep. for that to feel good. Because you want it to feel right. Yes. You don't want to be slowing things down and sort of being sitting there and going. FOMO. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think if, you, if you're if you in that place of, of real gratitude and that abundance mentality mm -hmm. around whatever it is you're doing, even if you're traveling like once every three years. But, you know, I have some friends here who haven't traveled in about five years. And she said, I'm still living in the memories of that trip. And it, I think beautiful. when you take a beautiful long trip, you yep. really can. And that's the way my parents still talk about the year that they took going in a van around Europe, mm -hmm. you know, and they still feel that and they still live that. And I, I want to feel a bit more of that. Yeah. Less yeah. is more. Yeah. Definitely. A hundred percent. And a notice around your lovely home here you've got a lot of pieces that you have bought on travels um yes. you know so i how how do you choose things um to buy and to bring home with you and and how do you feel when you look at them back here when they're when in your home do they transport you back there yeah they do they really do it's um yeah it it's i think i'm very careful about what i choose to bring back mm -hmm. because I know that I want it to last forever and I don't want to have, I don't know, a batik print or something that I'm not going to love in a couple of years. Yes. So most of the time I will buy one or two things that I will treasure forever. So I've got these amazing um, Ethiopian Coptic crosses that we got at Lalibela when we... Um, we were in Lalibela, which are these rock cut churches yeah, and incredible. Oh, spending Christmas Eve there with, can you imagine, t tens of thousands of pilgrims yeah. all dressed in white and were chanting all night long. And there were all these amazing priests everywhere with the crosses. And every time I look at them, I'm just transported right back there. And um, I also love textiles mm -hmm. and um I was in Guatemala earlier this year learning how to weave actually, which is another really beautiful way of slowing travel down is like picking one thing, mm -hmm. one granular thing in that culture that you really want to hone in on. Yes. And so for me, it was weaving because I love textiles and we learned how to weave from the Mayan, local Mayan weavers and it's a dying beautiful. art there. So it's a way of kind of perpetuating that part of their culture um and putting your finances directly back into that mm, mm. um and so i bought some some pieces there as well and every time i look at those i think my gosh it gives me such a renewed appreciation for cloth and mm -hmm. and for the clothes that we wear seeing how much care and art can go into these pieces yeah and i think just being surrounded by these things is another way of kind of extending the life of a trip mm -hmm. and not just being like okay that's done it's over it's yes, you're looking at it every day and you're being reminded of those important lessons that mm. you learn in that place every day and as there are there other tools or methods that you use at home um like if we talk about rituals, for example, mm -hmm. I know that you're a fan of morning pages, if you could Love explain them. that for mm -hmm. people that don't know, but any other rituals that you, that you use in your everyday life here that kind of help you in, in work, but also just in the lifestyle. I have so many rituals. <laughs> <laughs> I joked with a friend the other day that if self-care was an Olympic sport, I would be <laughs> a gold medal winner. Um, can you tell I don't have kids yet? Um, yeah, so morning pages are pretty essential for me mm -hmm. because my brain is very full and it's basically, it came from, it's a concept by Julia Cameron who mm -hmm. wrote um, The Artist's Way, which I think was written in the 80s and it's mm -hmm. still so relevant and an incredible book for any aspiring creatives out there it's basically a whole lot of exercises to tap into your creativity but she has three main ones and morning pages is one of them so basically yeah. you sit down for a set period of time every morning or until three pages are full and you yeah. just free write whatever is in your brain and it might be I'm so bored I don't know what to write or it might be some beautiful poetry it just depends whatever is mm -hmm. coming out that day and for me it's very rarely 
beautiful. <laughs> um, so it is just, it's clearing but the it's mind the and it's almost an active meditation. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I have a tea practice, which is another form of um, like a movement meditation. And there's okay. a beautiful guy called Sam up here who has a company called Cloud Hidden. Mm-hmm. And he teaches people how to sit for tea in a ceremonial way. Okay. Um, and it is such a beautiful practice because it's, you're you're drinking the tea but you are connecting to nature and you are connecting to yourself and pretty much every time I've sat in ceremony with him Mm -hmm. somebody has been in tears because I think we're so used to not giving ourselves that kind of time and yeah often as women not allowing ourselves to be served Mm -hmm. we're always the ones kind of giving out so to be served um is also really special yeah um yeah, I do. I do yoga. Um, I'm a big fan of taking baths, but trying to be more sustainable. I have given them up apart from, you know, once every fortnight or so now. But um, I do love a bath, Epsom salt bath. Yes. Um, and yeah, just a lot of quiet time when mm-hmm. I can get it mm-hmm. because I'm I think like a lot of a lot of people out there, an extroverted introvert, where you, when you're out in the world, you're you're really giving everything, yeah. but then kind of coming back to um, recharge in mm-hmm. your alone time, mm-hmm. and that is very important for me. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So I think you're doing a, an amazing job of it. Uh, but if somebody was to ask you how they could live more of a life unhurried, mm. what would be your first? You know, if you could give them one tip, what would it be? Yeah. Okay. So here is my tip. So in the book, Make a Living Living that I have written, there are exercises throughout the book because Mm -hmm. it's not just looking at these people with great lives and going on their lives. So great. It's how can you do it too? Okay. And a lot of them, most of them have very, very slow paired back lives. Mm -hmm. That was a big takeaway from the book. And so the first exercise, because there are eight exercises peppered through to, to help the reader do that, and it's about mind mapping. Mm-hmm. So I think if you want to slow your life down and pare things back, you can create a mind map of mm-hmm. your life mm-hmm. where your time, energy, and money is going. So you write your name in the center, yep. and then time, money, and energy okay. are branches off that. Yep. And you write down all the things that are draining that particular resource mm-hmm. for you. Like write all the activities that you do, all the things you're spending your money on, or oh, where is your time going? And I think we think we know, mm-hmm. but until you actually write it down, you realize very, very quickly what can go. Yeah. And that is how you reclaim those resources mm-hmm. for yourself. You just have to be brutal sometimes and cut things out yes. because we can't do everything. I think we think that we can and we are told particularly as women in society, that we can do it all, but yep. it's not a healthy way of being. You don't have to. No. <laughs> Who wants to? Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to be, I think if you want to be out there creating amazing work and being great to your family, maybe you have to give up being social for a while. Mm-hmm. You just have to say no to that. Or yep. or if you want to travel more, okay, what? look at your finances. What can you yes. pare back there to reclaim some of those things? I mean, when I first went freelance, I gave up a lot of things because, mm. you know, I stopped going to the hairdresser. I stopped buying clothes for a while I stopped eating out and it didn't none of it felt like a sacrifice yeah. because you're you're actually giving something huge to yourself and you're working towards a bigger goal so yeah. all those things actually don't matter anymore and Absolutely. I think if you if you mind map it all and get it physically in front of you it's it's very easy to figure out 